Thank you so much, Toya, and warmest welcome to Richard Heinberg and to all the guests um, to the audience today. Um, this is a researcher's desk um, webinar. Uh, usually it's uh, a lunch webinar, but today we have an evening gathering because Richard is uh, based in California, so because of the um, time difference. Uh, Richard is a, a very uh, prominent writer and journalist and author of many books um, focusing on um, our environmental problems and the connected social problems, uh, starting from uh, resource depletion uh, problems, growth, uh, economic system, uh, now coming to closer to um, social structures. And today uh, we will talk about his very recent book um, on power. Uh, where he really dives deep into the different notions and the different concepts of power and um, how to how the human humankind uh, humanity can both um, um, use um, the power and also abuse the power and what can we do about that uh, the sort of recently uh, th through this fall uh, we had several um, webinars at Researchers Desk that focused on these um, more social science, uh, if you like, uh, perspectives or interdisciplinary perspectives, where we talked about alternative economic systems, for instance, or um, the political economy aspects of um, climate uh, mitigation, climate deterrence, and the lack of action on climate change, for example. Um, so this talk will be um, uh, I believe a very logical continuation of, of this um, project that we have. Uh, so very much welcome, Richard. Um, you will have about 20, 25 minutes to, to speak uh, to us, to present, and then uh, we will open the floor to the um, audience to ask questions. Uh, you're very welcome to write the questions in the chat um, or later raise your hand. Um, so we, I, I will help you um, to moderate and ask the questions. Um, welcome, Richard. Thank you, uh, Svetlana. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen so I can show some uh, PowerPoint slides, and it'll take a couple of clicks to get that going. Okay, now it should be, there we go. So this is the cover of, uh, of the book I'll be talking about. It just came out uh, about a month ago. And uh, it's, I would say the culmination of, uh, of my career as a researcher and writer. It's, uh, um, it's, a, it's quite a comprehensive book and it's a fairly ambitious book, but I, I felt that, uh, it was it was time <laughs> in my own career and and uh, and in the environment for it. The objective of the, of the book is not so much to propose a new solution to um, our our global problems, but more to uh, provide hopefully some understanding and and wisdom. Um, it, the book was motivated by three questions, and these questions have been rattling around in my mind for my entire adult life, but it's only fairly recently that I've been able to articulate them uh, in, a, in a, a you know brief, concentrated form. Uh, first question, how have we, just one species out of millions, uh, gotten so powerful as to bring the entire planet to the brink of climate chaos and a mass extinction event. Uh, we've taken over the planet, just one species. How and why has this happened? Uh, second, how and why have we developed so many ways of exploiting and oppressing one another? Uh, humanity, of course, is a very social species, and there are other social species, and most social species have hierarchies, uh, division of labor, uh, ants do it, bees do it, and uh, educated fleas do it, as Cole Porter said. Uh, so we, we human beings have 
as a social species found more ways of exploiting and oppressing each other and in more brutal ways of doing so than any other social, social species. Why, how? And finally, is it possible to change our relationship with power so as to avert uh, ecological catastrophe and, and social meltdown? <clears throat> so the word power is of course the title of the book. It's, it's key to the book, but it's a, it's a word with in English, a lot of meanings. I don't know if uh, this is true in Swedish, but in French and German, there are, are different words for different forms of power, social power as opposed to physical power. Well, uh, the English word power is, uh, as I say, it has, has a whole range of meanings. And I, I played on that in the book and used that to, to advantage. The first meaning, of course, is just from physics, mm. the, rate, the rate of energy transfer. Mm -hmm. um, and we use energy, of course, to do things. So in uh, common parlance, we, we say the, the, the power of flight or the power of speech. These are just ways of using energy to accomplish various, various things. But then <clears throat> again, in English, the word is also used actually most commonly to refer to social power, the ability of some people to get other people to do various things. So the ability to use other people's energy in effect. But social power is itself not always the same thing. Sometimes it can be horizontal social power where we just all join together to accomplish something. Uh, other times it's what could be called vertical social power, where some people are able to tell lots of other people what to do using incentives and threats. Uh, the word can also mean, you know, the power of ideas and inspiration, force of personality and, and so on. All of these are perfectly correct uses of the term and I explore all of them in the book. But let's start with energy. Energy, of course, is essential to everything we do. There is literally nothing we can do that doesn't require energy. And if you want to understand any organism, ecosystem, or society, follow the energy. Um, that's what I do in the first uh, couple of chapters of the book, um, especially the, the, the first chapter, following the development of power through biological evolution. Um, and one interesting factoid from that chapter is that gram for gram, the average organism is 10,000 times as powerful as the sun. Now that seems crazy at, at first thought, but if you do the, the math, it turns out to be true. The sun is extremely massive and uh, do the long division. And it turns out that uh, luminosity of the sun per gram is uh, only about 0.0002 milliwatts. Well, we can do a lot better than that. Of course, our power is derivative. We get it from the sun, whereas the sun is, is producing its own energy uh, internally. Nevertheless, life is extremely good at gathering and using power. Uh, <clears throat> we human beings, have become the power champions on the planet. How did we do that? Well, starting way back in uh, Paleolithic times through the development of uh, the control of fire, uh, the making and use of tools, clothing, which enabled us to live in inhospitable environments, uh, and language, which was in many ways the sort of the master technology, which enabled us to teach uh, tool making and tool use to others. So gradually through these, these advantages, we gain more and more power over ecosystems and other species. Uh, the third chapter of the book is about the emergence of vertical social power. And this happened primarily during the Holocene, the last 10,000 years. Uh, through a process of self-domestication and domestication of other species. <clears throat> uh, this book here, uh, James C. Scott's Against the Grain, uh, is a very, very uh, good uh, recent summary of the, of the evidence on the emergence of the early, earliest state societies. These were societies that featured cities, 
uh, kings, full-time division of labor, uh, writing, money, all of these developments occurred together largely as a result of uh, human beings using grain crops. Uh, grains could be stored and therefore taxed. And the ability to tax uh, grain production led to social stratification. And, uh, and the rest is history. Here we are, the last 10,000, well, actually 7,000 years since uh, these innovations. <clears throat> now, once societies became stratified, once power relations became vertical, then those who were at the top of the social pyramid were making the rules for the society as a whole, and they tended to make the rules to their own advantage. And so over time in such societies, the, the wealth of the society tends to flow upward through the social pyramid to those at the top of the pyramid. And that creates a kind of uh, cyclical behavior. Peter Turchin, whose book here I recommend, um, <clears throat> started out as an insect ecologist and, uh, and uh, tackled problems in insect evolution using uh, <clears throat> uh, tremendous amounts of data and data analysis. And uh, once he'd solved those problems, he decided to use the same methodology to tackle prob human problems of social evolution. And in doing so, he, he, uh, he and his colleagues, he works with a, 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 quite a number of colleagues, have built a database of uh, measurable, quantifiable data about human societies over time. And, uh, and they've analyzed that data for patterns. And what they find is that there is a periodicity of um, uh, agrarian societies all through history, that uh, they tend to go through periods of growth and concentration. And, uh, and then they, they go through periods of stagnation and, and retreat collapse of societies, of civilizations, is a normal and predictable event. Okay, so now we get to the biggest power event in millions of years, which is the human development uh, of use of fossil fuels. Nothing like it in all of human history. These were uh, fuels that were created uh, slowly over time by nature. They represent tens of millions of years of ancient sunlight that's been concentrated into fuels that are portable and storable. Um, it, our, our development of fossil fuels required some precursors in terms of social behavior, uh, private ownership of natural resources, for example, uh, government protector, protection for investors. We know these were required because we can look back in history and see incipient moments when the fossil fuel revolution almost began. The, the most significant one was about ten, uh, um, a thousand years ago in China. Uh, the Chinese had lots of coal. They were privatizing land. Uh, there was a lot of innovation, technological innovation going on. So the Industrial Revolution almost started in China a thousand years ago, but it was cut off because the government thought that these uh, industrialists would be a threat to the existing political economic order, which undoubtedly they would have been. Uh, so instead, the fossil-fueled Industrial Revolution got started in Britain uh, a few hundred years later, and, and here we are. It changed everything. This is agriculture before fossil fuels. This is agriculture today. Um, before it took 80% of the population working on the land to produce enough food so there was a surplus to support the people living in cities. Today, 2% of people living on the land can do that. So what happened to all those people? Well, they all moved to cities and got jobs. Uh, this is a, uh, a little graphic from the US Department of Agriculture and it's it's, deceptive in a way because it says farm jobs as a percentage of total U.S. jobs. But in 1790, very few people had jobs on the farm. A job implies you're, you know, you, you're employed by somebody else. Most of those people were small landholders working for themselves or enslaved Africans working for somebody else. 
uh, the idea of almost universal employment of working for a company, that's very recent. And it's a result of urbanization, which in turn is largely a result of fossil fuels. On a per capita basis, our energy usage has grown 800% in the last 200 years as a result of access to fossil fuels. That's extraordinary. Again, absolutely unprecedented. And uh, uh, population has also grown 800% in the last 200 years. Again, absolutely extraordinary. So we've gotten used to the idea that things just grow in human societies. Grow, economic growth is just normal and it's, it, it's a good thing. Well, is it? <laughs> um, unfortunately, in, uh, in economics classes, uh, the, the, the arithmetic of exponential growth is not adequately explored. <laughs> it's not very complicated math. Anything growing at an exponential rate doubles in size in a given period of time. 1% uh, annual growth results in a doubling of a quantity in 70 years. 2% uh, 35 years, et cetera. Again, the math is simple. So we expect global economic growth of two or 3% per year. What does that actually mean in real terms? Well, as the economy grows, the amount of stuff that we're using, the amount of space we're taking up on the planet increases. So just since, since 1995, we've used about half the non-renewable resources ever extracted since the origin of humans. And we want that, that pace to actually increase with economic growth. It's insane, absolutely insane. So here's, um, here's a picture from Investopedia showing the economy. This is what econo economists think the economy is. Uh, but what's missing here? How about the planet? Uh, resources are not, are not infinite. Uh, and as we use them, we degrade them. We, we cause them to be, to be uh, degraded and spread around the earth and landfills and so on. So the argument I make in the book, uh, especially in the middle chapters of the book, is that you know, power is a good thing. We can't do anything without power but it's possible to have too much of a good thing. And that's what fossil fuels have done for us. They have given us so much power over nature and over one another that we're in danger of um, causing the human experiment to end prematurely. And we can see that in just about every you know, measurable uh, environmental uh, criteria. Uh, from climate change to uh, resource depletion, pollution, and also in, in social measures of economic inequality, which is increasing globally. Um, so how about climate change? Um, it's often discussed as if it were simply a technical problem of carbon emissions with a technical solution. All we have to do is substitute other sources of energy for fossil fuels. I argue in the book that instead it's a problem of power. And I, this, uh, this book cover is um, a study that I did with uh, David Fridley, who's on the energy analysis team at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We spent a year working together uh, to explore what a full transition to solar and wind power uh, would actually mean, uh, how feasible is it, what are the constraints, and so on. Of course, everyone knows that intermittency of sunlight and, and wind is a, a problem and it requires energy storage, source redundancy, demand management, and so on. Uh, less often discussed is what we call the 20% conundrum. Uh, solar and wind power produce electricity directly. This is true of nuclear power as well but only about 20% of the energy that we use globally is used in the form of electricity. Electricity, of course, is a very versatile uh, energy transfer medium. It's great, but uh, there are a lot of things that we do will, that will be hard to electrify, including a lot of high heat industrial processes, uh, aviation, and, and so on. Now, all of these things can be solved in the laboratory. 
at a laboratory scale, it's possible to electrify almost every process. It's possible to produce synthetic fuels uh, that can be used, for example, in long distance aviation, which would be extremely hard to electrify. Um, so what's the problem? Well, that laboratory scale solution is often very difficult to scale up to a, a level where it could you know, replace current processes in, uh, in global industries. In addition, there are limits to critical resources, everything from copper to nickel to lithium to, to sand. Who would have thought sand? But the sand that we use for producing silicon and even for concrete is, uh, is becoming scarce. And so, you know, we can imagine maybe producing one generation of solar and wind uh, infrastructure at scale to replace fossil fuels at, at our current scale of energy usage. But what do we do for an encore? Most of this technology would require replacement after say 25 or 30 years. Um, recycling is of course a partial solution but not a full solution because many of those materials would become degraded. So the, the reality with climate change is that any real solution is going to require that we reduce our energy usage and quite substantially in highly industrialized nations. That means giving up power. And I, I argue in the book that that's the case across the board, solving our major human problems, whether they're economic or political or environmental is going to require some people to give up a lot of power and humanity as a whole to give up uh, considerable power over nature in terms of land use, population, energy usage, and so on. Um, global inequality, you know, can we, right now we're trying to solve the problem of inequality just through economic growth. If the pie grows larger, then even if, you know, some people have huge pieces, the billionaires have huge pieces, well, at least the poor people will have bigger slices than they currently have. But if you can't continually grow the economy, then that solution fails. The only real solution is to basically tax the rich and redistribute wealth, um, which means giving up powers, the very powerful people having to give up power. Um, no, oops. Now, so are we capable of power self-limitation? And there are cynics who say, no, of course not. You know, everybody always wants more. And, you know, it's just the nature of biological organisms to always want more power. And it's, it's true, there is in, um, in evolutionary biology, the concept known as the maximum power principle, which says that this, you know, the organism or species that is able to use the most power for survival purposes is, will thrive and, and uh, uh, outcompete others, true. But also throughout nature, there are mechanisms for limiting power. Uh, and in the book, I call that the optimal power principle. I, did, I couldn't find that anybody else had ever named it before. So I took the opportunity. Everything from homeostasis in individual organisms to balancing mechanisms in ecosystems, uh, we see it everywhere. And in human societies as well, going all the way back to hunter-gatherer times where uh, bands had ways of discouraging bullies from arising, you know, ostracizing them or uh, capital punishment in the worst instances, uh, sharing resources, conserving natural resources. We do it in the modern world uh, using democracy to keep tyrants from taking over uh, financial regulations to keep people from cheating, environmental regulations, taxes. So if we can limit power, why aren't we doing it sufficiently now in order to prevent these horrific problems like climate change and global economic inequality and so on? Well, there are a number of reasons I explore in the book, all of them arguably uh, true, but I think the one that is most persuasive is simply that fossil fuels have given us so much power so fast that we've gotten used to the idea that there will always be more 
that we can solve every problem with more energy and more money. Um, if we destroy the earth, it's not a real problem because we can always jet off to other planets. We can colonize Mars or other solar systems. And that's, that's a very deceptive way of thinking about the world because the planet is a limited place. And ultimately, we will bump up against those limits. And we're doing so. The symptoms are everywhere. So in the final chapter of the book, I explore the future of power. Where is this all headed? Uh, I think there's a spectrum of, of possibilities that ranges from collective self-restraint to collective self-annihilation. I don't see the, the likelihood of a future in which we just continue to grow our population, our per capita energy usage and so on through the end of this century. I don't think there are enough uh, resources available to enable that to happen. So uh, collective self-restraint, I think is the best option that we can hope for. Um, so where do we have to do that with regard to a whole range of human collective human behaviors, population, resource extraction, waste dumping, energy usage, land use, inequality, uh, armaments. There are people working already in all of these areas. This is, these are not new ideas, but they, they need to work much more successfully with a lot more help and they need to work together. They need to understand that all of these efforts are united by a, a common thread, which is the limitation of over-empowerment. Um, that's not a catchy phrase, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's important that folks working in the social justice silo understand that they have a fundamental alliance with people who are working in, to halt climate change and economic inequality and so on. So I'll just end with a quote from uh, my favorite philosopher. As I said, my goal with, with this book is really not so much uh, a, a new whiz-bang solution to a technical problem. It's more uh, wisdom. And, it's a whiz and I think wisdom is, uh, goes far back in human history. It's not something that, that was just invented 10 minutes ago. Uh, knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is wisdom. Mastering others may be strength, but mastering yourself is true power. So that's the book. And I'm happy to um, discuss it with you all. Let's see if we can uh, stop sharing. And here we are. Well, thank you very much, um, Richard. That was... Uh very effective and uh, I think a very exciting uh, journey that you took us on. And um, let's, uh, let's see you, uh, the audience, you're welcome to write questions or raise your hand. Um, but I can maybe start um, by uh, reflecting a little bit on what you said last about the collaborations, um, because uh, there is uh, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of initiatives there are lots of um, ideas that are being developed on the common good, on the restoration, on the permaculture, the rights of nature, the sort of donut economics and, and other um, models for um, economic development. Um, there is uh, Fridays for Future. This network has been created as an answer to the young people in Sweden and globally uh, coming together. And so this is the effort of uh, the research community to support them. Um, and um, sort of enough of, uh, enough of collaboration. Uh, how do we achieve enough of collaboration? How do we build it that it's big enough? Um, mm. as, as I think you, you, uh, you also mentioned is that we are at, at a sort of a point where things are balancing because we have come to a point when um, it is very difficult to actually say that, uh, okay, there still are possibilities to continue doing what we're doing and be build some sort of sustainability. 
Um, some people still try to do that. Uh, there is a reaction today uh, in many ways. Um, but do you have any sort of good examples or uh, encouragements for those different small NGOs or for small um, uh, networks and, and uh, movements to build this collaboration? Mm. Um. Well, I'll try to think of some good examples, but meanwhile, just an observation. Um, the recent COP26 uh, meetings, um, I think, led many people to uh, a, a new realization, which is that the, the people in charge, the people with the most power, are not likely to do what's necessary to solve the climate dilemma. Um, and that's something I actually could have predicted from the research I did with the book. Uh, there's, a, there's a long section in the book on the social psychology of power and the research that's been accomplished, especially just in the last 10 years. Uh, social power, those who have social power uh, are changed by it. And the research shows very reliably that those with a lot of social power, whether it's in the form of wealth or fame or whatever, a political position, uh, tend to lack empathy. Their empathy is diminished as a result of their social power. They also tend to, uh, to be blind to risk to uh, an increasing degree as a result of, of having social power. So when we have a big meeting like COP26 and we get a lot of the most powerful people in the world together, political leaders, billionaires like Bill Gates and so on, put them in a, in a big room together. What can we anticipate? Not enough <laughs> is, is the obvious answer. And that's what we saw. So um, I, I think the, the, the conclusion that a lot of people took away from COP26 is that it's really up to us and, um, the, uh, history shows it's true. Um, the, the, our, our, our political leaders and economic leaders are not going to solve these problems for us. Now, what does that look like? Does that mean revolution? I don't know. Uh, Extinction Rebellion is one group that is you know, looking to use civil disobedience as, as a means of uh, effecting change in climate policy. Maybe that is the only avenue left. I don't know. Um, all I can do is is observe the situation. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so when I was listening to you now, I thought that uh, the people who are who have the so like this um, social power, it's not only the people who are negotiating at COP twenty six. It's all of us in the one billion people who have the. So we probably all have to rethink um, these things. Um, now we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Anton, would you like to ask a question yourself or should I read it? Um, uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, yes, do you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you uh, for uh, very, like, uh, like you said, very neatly put, um, presentation and uh, yeah for me also when you end on that quote from uh, from the Tao I think or this uh, old wisdom yes. uh, what do you think about the, our way forward concerning spirituality and uh, is there any yeah like for me I can't see a way without this being a, an in a way spiritual matter uh, what are your thoughts on that and uh, how can this also be able to um, collaborate between so many different spiritual practices and traditions? Yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, my own relationship with spirituality is fraught. I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian household and I fled from it as soon as I could. Uh, I've been an atheist my whole adult life. And yet, I have to admit that um, spirituality, religion, uh, philosophy are essential to what makes us human. 
And uh, people are motivated by senses of, of ethics, of rightness, of uh, service to others. And all of these things are uh, almost the essence of, of, of spirituality, at least many, many strands of spirituality. So I, I think uh, world religions have a, a big path, uh, part to play in this. And uh, Pope Francis, I think, has, has made some very, very uh, useful uh, statements with regard to the environment, uh, the rights of other species, climate change, and, and so on. But it needs to go much beyond that. Ultimately, maybe we need a new Earth-based religion. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not the person to start it, and I don't know who is. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Alistair, um, please. Uh, thank you, Rick, uh, Richard, for a really inspiring talk. Um, uh, I find it very, very thought provoking. Um, I'm a natural scientist, and I'm one of the, and I kind of, uh, and I spent a lot of time reading sort of IPCC reports and things. And when I listened to your talk, I kind of thought, was, could you start from there to develop a pathway, just like the IPCC pathways, but a, maybe a more philosophical, philosophical pathway to um, solving this crisis? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. It, it certainly could be done. Um, and it would involve a, a, a range of actions on the part of governments that, that have already been proposed, uh, replacing GDP, for example, with quality of life and environmental health indicators. Right now, we're only aiming really for GDP growth. That's, that's the, the prime directive for governments around the world and economy and economists. Uh, but as we've seen, you can't grow economies forever on a finite planet. So we need to aim for other goods, other goals, quality of life, again, and environmental health. If we did that, we could change direction without enormous sacrifice in terms of quality of life. We, we might have to sacrifice rate of energy usage uh, we might have to sacrifice land use in some cases and other, other concrete things. But if we're enjoying ourselves more, if we're having more of a sense of community in the process, who cares? Um, rationing is something that governments could, uh, could increasingly undertake. The rationing of especially non-renewable uh, materials, minerals, fossil fuels, uh, carbon emissions. Now, rationing has a, a long history in societies, often very successful. Um, in, during and immediately after World War II, uh, Britain rationed all kinds of things, and the British people, uh, there were surveys taken, the British people were actually better nourished under food rationing than they were after rationing ended, and the economy started in, in improving. So, rationing could be very good for us. But of course, a lot of people will resist. Now we already have rationing by price. So a lot of people are crowded out of the use of resources and energy simply because they can't afford it. Rationing would enable everyone to have what they need in order to get by, but they would strongly discourage a uh, few from overusing resources that we can't afford to overuse. So that's, that's another pathway that could be implemented. Um, but again, these things are going to take a big change of, of heart and mind on the part of uh, world leaders. And they are, they are disinclined to make these kinds of changes until they're more or less forced to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was a really great answer. I'd actually like to see that kind of pathway written down as a as another way of looking at this problem compared to the IPCC uh, approach, which is I have a lot of respect for, but they are exactly as you're talking about, they're more how you solve the technical aspects and it will probably never solve it that way. So I think that's really, really good. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, although Thank I think you. it's already in the book. I'll read the book first. Thank you very much good. for your time. I pass the questions on to the next person. Thanks, Thanks Alistair. Alistair. Uh, thanks. Uh, Jennifer. Please. 
Yeah, I think Sila in the chat might have come before me. Um, I don't know if you want me to just keep going and then you go to Sila after. Keep okay. going, we'll, we'll take Sila's question next. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Oh yeah, Richard, it's great to be talking with you because you've been an inspiration to me for a while. You're part of what got me into post-growth research, which is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. So um, it's really nice to be talking to you. And actually my focus has gotten me into thinking about the relationship societies have with profit. And when you talked about the relationship societies have with power, it sort of resonated on that same level. Um, and I then saw in one of your slides these self-reinforcing dynamics of capitalism, um, but you didn't say anything about it. So I'm actually quite curious to hear what you've found and what you've been thinking about in terms of um, profit-driven institutions and capitalism and how mm -hmm. what role that plays in all of this. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, profit-driven institutions um, work best in a context of, of growth or opportunities for growth. Um, and that's, of course, what we've seen over the past number of decades. However, uh, profit-making institutions can still persist after the end of growth uh, when societies are shrinking. But then they, they start looking really um, um, pretty dire. I mean, activities like kidnapping for ransom and uh, you know, theft on an organized scale, organized crime. I mean, that's that's what you know, profit seeking starts to look like in societies that are that are contracting. And again, I'm speaking from you know historical evidence. So, um, if if we are approaching you know, the end of economic growth as we've known it for the last number of decades and, and are moving into a, a different era of human society. I think we have to rethink the profit motive as a, um, as a way of organizing people's work and people's activity. Um, it, it certainly can be done. Uh, we have instances of, instances of that uh, again throughout history and even relatively modern history, not all of them successful. But uh, continuing to rely just on profit as a way of organizing society, I think, could be uh, could lead to grim results. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, taking question from the chat, uh, and I understand this is a question you get quite a lot. Uh, but um, do you have a, any advice to give the young people? Mm -hmm. From, from where you stand today? Yes. First of all, to young people, I say, I apologize. As a representative of the baby boomer generation, we have failed you. Full stop. Um, we had the information back in 1972 with the Limits to Growth Report. Uh, I read that when I was 21 years old and it changed my life. It's been the organizing principle of my life ever since. Uh, but the, uh, most people of my generation did not do that. And we have uh, done, we have done things for which I am personally ashamed. And I think, I think everyone in my age should be. Okay, that, that out of the way, what, so what's next? Well, I think the, there's opportunity now for the redesign of almost every aspect of how we live. Uh, two ways of looking at this. One is that you know, we, we're giving you a, a way of living that is unsustainable and is gonna crash. That's the negative way of looking at it. The positive way of looking at it is, here's a clean slate. We need, <laughs> we need new ways of growing food. We need to completely rethink how we do healthcare. We need to completely rethink how we do security. All of the, the basic uh, aspects of, of you know, human society demand almost a complete redesign this century. So regardless of your particular interest and talents and skills uh, as a young person, uh, you have a, a, an, a enormous range of opportunity open to you to make a huge difference, not only for yourself and your generation, but for generations to come. 
Yes, um, thank you. I would like to um, give the word to Niklas Hellström. Um, please, Niklas. Uh, you're still muted. Sorry, classic. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you, Richard, for a, an amazing uh, a talk. I, I can't believe that this, you fit everything in <laughs> in such a short time. It's like um, covering everything, really. And, and uh, so lots of things to discuss, obviously. I was intrigued by one thing here, which was when you talked about um, optimal power. Mm. I think that's really key, and and, um, and 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 looking across various areas in terms of examples and so on. And I, I think that is where we really are, right? And that's that's um, um, just reflected on on a report that came almost fifty years ago called "What Now: Another Development" um, that mm. uh, my prior workplace is part of creating and it had a, a classic article called what how much is enough for make a in swedish you know which really put this front and center you know uh, there was a debate around these things actually you talked about restraints in a positive way exactly in the manner you're talking about it as you know a path to the common good and it makes sense and we can't just expect there to be more and more in a frantic pace and of course i was swept aside uh, not because it was bad ideas but because of our certain interest to who who succeeded in 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 really you know per being pervasive in in colonizing everyone's minds almost mm -hmm. neoliberalism and capitalism and, and so on and so forth but i think we so i'm really intrigued by your kind of like so what are there in terms of actually existing examples across various sectors to to you know um examples of regulating power of of optimizing power um and what can be learned from that so I, i'd be intrigued to hear some more reflections from your uh, end uh, because i think that's what we we really need to do right and and i think also that making the connection to the the, the fossil fuels and the energy the actual energy energy kind of part in your talk is also really key because i think as we scale down the fossil fuel industry and incidentally the the in, what inspires me the most right now is uh, the the traction the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty initiative is, is having that some of you are aware of and and seeing that really um uh getting uh, very energizing people and, and mobilizing people but also then recognizing that the alternative is not just the same but different it's a, it's a qualitatively different energy system that is is distributed and actually keeps down energy use and, and sufficiency and kind of local economic development and so on in in a way that is 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 dramatically different not just in terms of source of energy but the very, very nature of organizing society right mm -hmm. um so that goes back to those organizing principles so not ramble on forever but but i think um yeah i'm just curious to hear your thoughts on on uh, when this actually works and if there's any common threads around when those optimizations are Working. Right. Well, in terms of um, social power, I think cooperatives provide a, a wonderful example of something that works on the ground right now in thousands of instances around the world. Um, so I, I don't, you know, there's lots that's been written about this already, so I won't go into more detail, just to point out that, uh, you know, cooperatives provide a, a, a wonderful example of horizontal social power in action and how it can benefit everyone within the community. Uh, second, I would uh, suggest looking into um, tradable energy quotas as a form of energy rationing that can be used either with carbon emissions or with fossil fuels or with all energy. I, I think it's best used with all, all forms of energy, but could just be used with, with uh, carbon or fossil fuels. The tradable energy quotas, it's, it's a form of rationing developed by uh, a British uh, economist uh, named David Fleming, um, whose book is sitting right here, <laughs> um, that the, the British government has looked into on several occasions. And I think they kind of have it 
waiting in the wings when it's actually going to be necessary to, to implement. They don't want to do it beforehand, which is unfortunate because the sooner they do it, the better it will be. But it could be a, a terrific way of, of ratcheting down carbon emissions or energy usage in a cooperative way that you know penalizes the, the energy guzzlers and actually incentivizes everybody else. Um, so um, I want to leave more time for questions, so I won't say more right now. Thank you. Uh, Alexander, um, please. Yes. Um, hi, Richard. Uh, thanks a lot for a nice, uh, a nice talk and a, what seems to be an extremely interesting book. Um, I'm a political scientist working on constitutions, which is uh, exactly a way of uh, uh, limiting power the way we've been limiting political right. power in the last 200 years. Um, so so I, I, I like that you're making the link between the two. I think it's exactly on point. My question was about the French philosopher Jacques Ellul, who developed the concept of non-power as a way to mm -hmm. Um, already think about uh, the ecological problem and how to resolve them, uh, maybe in the 60s. So I wondered, um, so the idea of non-power is, is to choose not to do things we can do, basically, or for example, not using a technology we have available or not developing a technology we could develop. So I guess my question is, have you bumped into this concept and what's your take on it? Absolutely. Jacques Ellul was one of the most brilliant philosophers of the 20th century and, and one of my inspirations. And uh, his, um, his, his take on technology is exactly right. I mean, just because we, can't, we can do something doesn't mean we should. Uh, and I would, I would point, point us all toward um, the work of um, a, uh, a, a guy, I'm, I'm trying to think of his name right now, but it's eluding me, but he, he has a, a site on the internet that's easy to find called Low Tech Magazine low tech magazine and he's he's worked in the technology sector himself so he's a he's a brilliant guy he's an engineer so he's not a technophobe but he understands the kinds of constraints that we've been talking about over the last hour and he realizes the future is going to be characterized more by low technology that people can actually directly control rather than high technology that's out of their control and that increasingly just doesn't work anymore because we don't have an, an, enough energy to make it work. And he, sa he says, look, you know, low tech solutions are often very elegant ways of solving basic human problems. And they also often, not always, but often offer opportunity for people to uh, regain useful skills and therefore more of a sense of competency, personal competency, and control over the circumstances of their own lives. So I think that's brilliant. And, uh, uh, you know, when somebody starts talking about high tech, uh, the sort of blinders go over my eyes. But when somebody starts talking about low tech, I think, hey, this, here's somebody who, who's actually thinking for themselves. And I, I think that's much more interesting. Great, so um, let's give uh, the word to, to Anders um, for the last uh, raised hand and then we uh, get to the, to the chat questions. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for an excellent talk and I agree with almost everything uh, you, you said, but uh, except maybe that uh, you, I think it's a, a more System, uh, system approach in the uh, social science part uh, sh should be fruitful. Uh, you talk about the empathy of decision makers and so on, uh, and I don't doubt that they can have, can have limited empathy, but, but I also think they are bound up in the system. Uh, and as well as the politicians, um, the politicians are involved in a, a system uh, where continuous growth is necessary to keep their positions and keep their voters. Uh, so so uh, we, we, and then we could talk about different pathways. Uh, 
to solve this in different steps uh, by limiting power and uh, and rationing and such uh, methods. I, I agree with them, but who should implement them? The system is not open for this. So I think the only solution is very strong public opinion and mobilization and civil disobedience. You were into that. Uh, it's uh, the only way I can see. Uh, the Fridays for Futures and the Extinctions Rebellion were very successful before the corona. And yeah. now we don't know what will, will happen. But uh, I, I think the only solution is growth of such uh, movements and uh, uh, public oppositions in many different forms, of course. I, um, thank you, Anders. I, I think we, we just have a couple of minutes left. So would you like to comment? Uh, I, I don't really have a comment. I, 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 yeah, thank you for that. I thought it was very, very mm -hmm. useful. Uh, we have also um, several questions, unfortunately, in the chat, but um, uh, I, I'd like to uh, maybe invite uh, Jennifer uh, Newell to, to speak, if, if, you, if you would like to unmute. Oh, hi there. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I didn't have a great connection, so I will need to rewatch the discussions and see what I missed. Um, but what I did capture and I wanted to say, first of all, thank you for the apology that you, you gave in, in giving advice to the younger generations, because that's a voice that's really heard. And when you kind of can feel that that is, is the case, it's, it's really nice to hear that it is seen elsewhere, too. So first of all, thank you. Um, it was an, an inspiring apology, so thank you. Um, but yeah, is awareness um, the kind of, sorry, I'll go back to my question. Um, uh, yeah, is awareness the key to empowering the individuals um, to, yeah, realize that we are working together um, and see a, an alternative means from what we are painted the picture of at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, awareness is is huge. I mean, very very few people uh, even understand that the the <laughs> some of the simplest things we we've, we've talked about this afternoon, uh, uh, like the the mathematics of compound growth as it applies to uh, you know human society and materials and energy usage and so on. Uh, something as simple as that is just. It's, it's nowhere in textbooks. People don't see it when, when they turn on the TV or look at social media, whatever. So awareness of limits is extremely important. And that we do this in a, in a way that is pro-social is extremely important because what we're seeing right now is the erosion of social cohesion in many countries, particularly the United States. And if we don't have social cohesion, we will not be able to solve our problems. Full stop. So rebuilding social cohesion is a job in and of itself. And that means um, adhering closely to the truth, to the facts, not demonizing others, even if they're behaving badly. Uh, correct, cor talk about behavior and correct behavior, but don't demonize people. Um, and, and, and we have to rebuild our sense of community so that we can get through this. It's going to be a difficult time. There's just no way around it at, at this point, no matter what policies we implement or whatever. We have, we have grown our, our social appetites to such an unrealistic scale that the process of scaling them down is going to be problematic in various ways, no matter what we do. We can minimize those problems if we work together cooperatively. And that's the best, that's the best route with the best outcome. So uh, I think we're at, at the end of our time. So that's, that's my ult ultimate recommendation, rebuild social cohesion, get along with the people around you and help build awareness. 
Thank you so much, Richard. And that was a really um, beautiful conclusion, which I think also answers a few questions that were left in the chat about the different groups and the nuclear power proponents and things. And um, maybe we all, um, we people who of high socioeconomic status research uh, degrees and, and so on. So maybe we need to spend more time on what uh, the inner development goals um, suggesting us and on our self-awareness and our way of working with other people. So that was really um, inspiring and thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you, Svetlana. Thank you for moderating. And good thank luck you everyone. very much, Richard. Thank you, Svetlana. Thank you so much.